Now we're at a nice point where we've seen some examples of how these major fields of mathematics interact. I want to show you another example um, that brings in calculus in um, a, a, maybe a more interesting way, but a little bit of a deeper way. And um, it's going to give us some insight. It's not going to be super necessary to actually state the Hodge conjecture, but it's going to give us some insight as to how mathematicians actually think about it and the tools they actually use. And the tools um, actually go back to Hodge uh, as well in the theorems that he proved, not just conjectures. So let's put it in uh, full screen mode. So let's do a little bit of a digression on more calculus, how it relates to topology, geometry, and actually physics. I'm going to use a very physical model um, to think about this. So I want to think about the flow of a fluid. To be simple, um, the flow is going to be moving in a plane. So what you want to think about is uh, just a table where fluid can flow around. Um, you might want to think of an air hockey table so that the fluid, if it wants to, can kind of sink into the holes or come out of the holes um, that the air comes out of in an air hockey table because um, that might that, that allows the fluid to be a little bit more flexible. Um, the mathematical model for that is you put at every point in the plane, you draw an arrow for the velocity of the, uh, the fluid at that particular point. So the fluid here is going up and to the left, the fluid here is going up and to the right, um, here it's moving faster, here it's moving slower. And mathematically, the name for that, where at every point you put an arrow, is called a vector field. And vector fields de describe many, many things, but fluids are a really good physical model to think of. Um, so one of the things that you can measure that's very interesting to measure about a, a fluid is is it sort of circulating, is it swirling around? And I want to talk about two versions of that and the relationship between them is, is a hugely favorite theorem of mine. Um, one of them is a global version. So I've drawn this circle and it can be any closed curve but I, and notice, ooh, closed curve, topological cycle maybe? Yes. Um, here's a circle to be simple in the plane and what I'm going to talk about is what's called the circulation of this vector field or this fluid around this loop. And so what I'm trying to, to measure is on the whole, on average, is this fluid trying to circulate around this, this uh, loop? And in, if so, on average, in what direction? Or is it going across it? Or is it just kind of standing still? Um, so what you do is at every point, like at this point right here, uh, well, first of all, you need to orient this loop. Again, that's exactly what a topologist would tell you to do. So I'm going to say, I'm going to walk along this loop counterclockwise. And so here I am at this point, for example, walking counterclockwise. And I just ask, is the fluid flowing with me or against me? Here, the fluid is generally flowing with me. And so I color that green. And pretty strong, a big, big thick bunch of green because it's a pretty strong fluid and it really is pointing pretty close to my direction. Here, for, uh, here, for example, as I go around counterclockwise, I'm going this way. The fluid is going strongly against me, and I'm indicating that as, as orange. So the green is a color for positive, and an orange is a color for negative here. And the thickness indicates how much of a positive or negative number I'm going to get. At this point, it's basically flowing across, and so it's not really trying to circulate around or, or, any, or um, in either direction. Here it's going with me. Here it's going a little bit against me. Here it's neutral again. And then I just basically add up all this contribution. What I, in terms of the, this geometrical model with the green and, uh, and orange, I'm really just counting how much green area is there and subtracting the orange area. Looks like overall the green's going to dominate. And so what we say is that there's a positive counterclockwise circulation of this vector field along this curve. If I made this curve out of like a tube and I let the, the fluid do what it wants to do and I put like a, um, maybe I put a little, uh, feather or something in the tube, I would, I would on average generally see the feather try to go in a counterclockwise direction. Okay, So that's a global version of circulation. I add up all of it all at once to get a one number for the entirety of this loop. Here's what you could call a local version of the same idea. Instead of putting a big loop, I'm going to just focus on one point. And the usual model that you, you uh, are told to picture here is put a little water wheel here with a vertical axis. So we're looking, um, let's say, imagine we're looking down on a table of fluid. And so vertical actually mean into or out of the, the screen here. And we're putting this, this water wheel here, and it can either turn clock, counterclockwise or clockwise. And why would it turn one way or the other? Well, look here. 
the arrows on the top side are a bit stronger than the arrows on the bottom side here. And so I'm going to predict it's going to have a tendency to go counterclockwise because the force here is bigger than the force here. And so we could assign a number here that says there is going to be a tendency to go counterclockwise. Usually mathematicians call that positive. Um, if I looked at the water wheel in a different location, down here, down here, down here, I could get different numbers. And so in fact, for every point in the plane, I will get a, a number, a local version of circulation. It's called, roughly called the curl of this vector field. And it's something that it's assigned to every point. So this is a local calculation, because I could assign 100 different people to calculate all these numbers, and they can just report to them, them independently to me. And, um, and that's not something where they're trying to put them all together in a global package. But what if they do? Here's the very, very cool thing. If you start with this loop, one person can do the global calculation, which is the entire sum of all these things on the edge of the loop. And some, it turns out that you can get the same answer by instead hiring a team of people with these little um, water wheels. I should have dragged it inside. I forgot to do that. I hire a bunch of people with these water wheels. And at every point, they look at what the local circulation number is inside the loop. And the big fact is that the sum of the local circulations is equal to the global circulation. In the plane, that's called Green's theorem. It's a gener the generalization to higher dimensions is called Stokes' theorem. And it's a huge, huge, huge theorem. And it's exactly a wonderful um, example of this interplay of local and global. This, that the, the, if you add up how much the, the, the fluid is circulating, uh, swirling around here or circulating here and here and here and here and here and here, turns out the sum of that gives you this one number that gives you the global circulation. Um, I have other videos about why that's true that, that are at a bit of a higher level, but if you can, you can look at um, my other videos about just look for greens and soaks there, basically. Okay. So here's an example of what's called irrotational fluid flow. If I put a water wheel at any point here, it's going to have no tendency to turn because there's no turning to this guy. It's all about diverging away from the origin. Um, and if you draw the circle here, let's see, I forgot to do that. If you draw the circle here, it's not too hard to imagine that the vector field, the flow, is always going across the circle, not along it counterclockwise or clockwise. There's no rotation globally or locally. So here, there's no local circulation, no global circulation, which makes sense based on the, the connection that I'm claiming between these concepts. Here's a more subtle example, and a really cr crucial one for us. Um, here's a, f a vector field, a flow called, that I call the vortex vector field. It's always going counterclockwise, and it's going slowly away from the origin, and faster and faster as you go in. And one really important thing, it's hard for a computer to picture this accurately, is that right at the origin, the arrow length goes to infinity. And so in fact, to make this a well-defined object, I have to take out the origin. So already, there's some topology going on, that to make this thing well-defined, I have to take the flat plane, which is a very simple object topologically, and take out a point, which may seem like a trivial operation, but it actually changes the topology dra drastically, and we'll talk about that in a second. So here's, some, so here's a surprising fact about this particular vector field, and it's a very particular way that these arrows grow as you go into the origin that makes this work. The claim is that there's actually no local circulation to this vector field. That's a little surprising. Let me say a little bit why. Um, it looks like these arrows are turning at every point. Well, doesn't that mean there's some tendency for a water wheel placed, say, at this point to turn? Well, it turns out no. There's two things that cancel out. One is that the ar these arrows are turning, and, and they seem to be turning in a counterclockwise direction, which seems like it would make anything placed in this object, in this, in this fluid, turn counterclockwise. But look at the lengths of the arrows. Let's look like right here, for example. Let's place our water wheel right here. The arrows are going up stronger on the left-hand side than they are on the right-hand side. That gives a tendency to move something clockwise. Turns out, if you make it exactly correctly, this vector field, um, those two tendencies cancel out exactly, and you get no rotation locally. But this does have a global circulation. If you draw a circle around the origin here, and I, and I look at the global way of calculating circulation. I go around, I walk around, and I say, are the vector f these arrows always pointing with me? Yeah, they're always pointing counterclockwise. So there is a global circulation here. Okay, But that might seem contradictory. Um, I said that the global circulation was the sum of the local circulations. Well, 
I had to, I have to go back and say a little bit more carefully what was going on here. The when the Green's theorem, it says if I've got a global curve and I look at the global circulation, that's going to be equal to the sum of the local circulations if I can kind of stretch a membrane all from f uh, across the entire in, uh, interior of this curve. And that membrane can't go through any points that I have taken out of my space. Another way to say that, it's not quite the same thing, but it's related, is that this curve can be shrunk progressively down to a point to nothing. And remember, that's a topologist notion of the fact that this curve, topology, isn't very interesting. It's, it's trivial topology, topologically. Now what's going on here? Um, Green's theorem would apply if I could get a meaningful circulation number, if I could sort of stretch a fabric across this whole disk, and at every point on the fabric I could get a meaningful circulation number. But you know what? I can't stretch that fabric in the first place, and I certainly can't get a meaningful circulation number right at the origin, because those vector arrows are going to an infinite length. And so Green's theorem is a little harder to see how it might apply, and it doesn't apply in sort of the obvious way, where a bunch of zeros sum up to, well, that would be zero, and we know it's not summing up to zero. The main point I want to make is that all these calculations of swirliness and circulation, those are all calculus calculations. Um, it's all about direction and flow and movement and change. Those are calculus calculations, but they're deeply affected by topology. As I said, taking the one point out of the plane uh, to make this vector field legal is a drastic effect topologically. And the, the simplest way that that shows up is that this circle was topologically trivial if I have the whole plane. As soon as I pluck out that point at the origin, um, I can't deform this back to, to nothing, and so it's not trivial anymore. So that's why this doesn't contradict Green's theorem. So we can't shrink a circle to a point in this space, the plane minus the origin. The origin is bad. And so the circle is a non-trivial topological cycle. And there's even a deeper thing we can say about that. So that, that just sort of saves us from a contradiction. But there's a deeper w thing we can say, which is that, and this, is, this is, goes back to um, various people, including uh, Georges de Ram, um, but also especially Hodge himself, is one of his major contributions, is that this loop, to, the topologist advertises this loop and says, this is my picture of why this space is interesting, why the plane minus the origin is interesting, why it has non-trivial topology. It's because here's a nice loop that is not trivial, it's not deformable to, to uh, shrinkable to a point. Okay. Hodge says, you know what? These arrows, this particular very special vector field, is also a representation of the non-trivial topology of this space. And let me tell you, tell you a tiny bit more about this special vector field. This special vector field, not only if you um, put a water wheel at every point, except of course at the origin, does it not turn. That means it has no curl. It also has what's called no divergence. If you look at a little box, any kind of little box around, around any point in the plane, except of course the origin, um, and you ask how much fluid is flowing out of the box, the answer will always be zero. That's another interesting analysis, which is exactly similar to the, the rotational analysis. Um, and it turns out that this vector field has both those wonderful properties. It's irrotational and incompressible. There's nothing squeezing or stretching about this fluid. Um, and that's called a harmonic vector field, when you have those con conditions combined. And what Hodge basically said, it gets more complicated in higher dimensions, but Hodge basically said that there's kind of one special harmonic vector field associated to every non-trivial topological cycle. So that the topologist draws this circle as evidence that there's interesting topology Hodge says draw this fluid flow, this vector field. It's very cool. As a little more complicated example of that, in a plane with two points deleted, I've taken out this point and this point that are the circle centers of these circulations, I could have a combination of flow of, of this sort of vortex-like nature around here and around here. This is, once again, a picture of a vector field that doesn't spread out or converge at any point, and it really actually has no rotation if I put in a, um, a little water wheel, it won't spin at, every, at any point. Again, not at these two points because they've been taken out of our space. So a topologist would say, oh yeah, you take delete two points from the plane, now there's two special cycles. This red cycle is something that can't be shrunk to a point without 
going past this point. And the blue cycle can't be shrunk to a point. Oh, another, I, I had forgot to say, another way to think about this, the topologist version, is just take a piece of paper and stick a pencil down right here and just don't ever move the pencil. And then just put a rubber band around the pencil. Can you shrink that rubber band to nothing? Can you shrink it to a point without um, lifting the pencil? And you can't. Okay, because you've declared the pen, the place where the pencil intersects the paper, to be um, forbidden. Similarly, if you put a pencil here, you can't deform the blue loop to nothing. And it's not too hard to convince yourself you can't deform the red loop, whose basic nature is to circle around this pencil, into the blue loop or vice versa. Okay, so there should actually Hodge says if there's two special cycles, you should be there sort of should be two special vector fields. What I've drawn here is a combination of both vector fields. Here, as Hodge would say, here's a flow, it's exactly the vortex vector field circling around this point that kind of is, corresponds to this red cycle, and here's the vortex vector field that corresponds to the blue cycle. So it's an incredible connection between special calculus objects and topological cycles. And so it says that the link between topology and calculus is very, very deep and very, very precise. Okay, so that is what um, Durham and Hodge come up with, an incredibly nice link between topology and calculus. Calculus says, make the object as n locally nice as possible. That's this condition to be uh, irrotational and divergence free. And then ask yourself, what can happen? The topology says, aha, I can tell you exactly what can or can't happen with those, those, those things. Um, they have to have certain properties based on what you may or may not have taken out of your space, what kind of holes you have. So um, that's a wonderful connection that, that uh, these folks came up with between topology and calculus. And it's um, when you look at the Hodge conjecture, and I'm not really going to say much about this, it turns out the way it actually gets stated and the way it gets analyzed is using very similar tools. Instead of working purely with cycles and loops and things like that and then relating them to equations or uh, polynomials or, or like um, algebraic cycles there's a lot of the this kind of uh, vector field kind of feel that you get to it okay it's a good place to stop this segment